it's wonderful to see a new way of engaging the world take off. And this is year two of the Semaphore World Econ Economic Summit. We were a founding partner, and there are just so many great people here from all around the world. So that part's been really energizing. Look, the conversation that we had on stage is the conversation that CEOs are having, which is you've got this world of incredibly rapid change and uncertainty. And how do you prepare your organizations to both be resilient in the face of shocks, which we've seen more than enough of over the last five years, and create the foundation to be able to innovate and grow and, and thrive in an extremely complex world? And so it was a really energizing discussion. The first thing we have to acknowledge is we're literally 16 months into generative AI as a major opportunity for business. Of course, people have been working on the technology for years. But it was really the end of November in 2022 when the ball really got rolling for the business world. I think the core thing that companies are discovering is that, yes, there will be generative AI tools that they can deploy that enable people to do their jobs in different ways. And that will drive some productivity. But to unlock major opportunities, to really unlock a step change in productivity, to unlock um, uh, deeper relationships with customers or new models of innovation, it requires a much more holistic approach where you're often combining generative AI and predictive AI with, with proprietary data, data that you have that others don't have. And you're putting a huge focus on the people and organizational models around it. That if you just think about this as a technology problem to solve and you don't recognize that you need to reskill and upskill people, you probably need to change how you're thinking about deploying your workforce. You need more ways of interacting across business functions to be able to really leverage these tools. You need different leadership cultures that can adapt and learn more quickly, that if you don't put all of those people elements in place and think of it as a transformation journey as opposed to a technology journey, then you're really not going to get the benefits that it has the potential to deliver. And in our client portfolio, the 250 now clients that we're supporting on generative AI, I think helping them identify which are the biggest opportunity areas so they don't go for a thousand flowers bloom and get lots of pilots but nothing of value, and then how to actually take on that holistic approach has been at the core of what so many companies are wrestling with. And frankly, we're learning a lot too. It's early on. So it's fun to be a part of a place like BCG at a time of so much change when we can have so much impact both in the world of predictive AI, before generative AI, and now in a world where people are combining both together, this idea that 10% of the effort is around the algorithms and the core sort of analytic elements, 20% needs to be around digital and data platforms, whether it's structured data in a predictive AI world or unstructured data in a generative AI world, to get accessibility to it, put it in the right form, ensure it's usable. Those are really important, but 70% of the work, the work, sits in all the things we need to do to help organizations adapt and transform themselves, how people build the skills that allow them to thrive and contribute and be a part of that journey and feel engaged and enabled as opposed to sort of being replaced. I mean, those elements are incredibly important. And we didn't know a year and a half ago as generative AI was just coming along whether it would hold up. But now that we've been through this journey with so many companies, I think we're finding it is at least as important now to focus on that 70% as it is on the on the algorithms and the digital and data platforms. I think a year ago, if you talk to CEOs, the first thing was all they read about in the media, all they heard about from pundits was we, they were either going to be in a world of super high inflation or we were going to need to induce a major recession with a huge spike in unemployment. So it was bad. We didn't know which bad news, but it was going to be bad news. And I think we were really in the minority back then about saying we thought a soft landing was possible. Inflation expectations weren't baked in. The, many of the elements were supply chain disruptions that we would work our way through. And a, and a year later, we don't have inflation quite as low as we want, but it's dramatically lower than it was. And I think people's inflation expectations have uh, are in the process and have to some degree already reset themselves. So that's very encouraging. And so... If you say, where does the economy rank in terms of risk versus a year ago, I'd say meaningfully lower, but not without its challenges, meaning a, a moderately growing economy still requires companies to be innovative. They now have less pricing power. They can't raise their own prices as much as they did. They still often have wage growth that's outpacing 
uh, their pricing power, so they have to get more productive. So there's still pressures, but much less top of mind on the macroeconomic side. On the flip side, the complexity of the world versus a year ago, as you say, two wars that um, it's unclear how they play out, and there's a great deal of concern. Each could spread in, in, in uncertain ways as well. There's political divisions all around the world, including in the United States, that continue to create massive uncertainty. And of course, U.S.-China relations, while they're not deteriorating at the rate they were a year ago, have in no way started to rebound. They've sort of plateaued, maybe going back to November, but plateaued at a lower level than you would like for the two leading economic powers in the world. And so that presents real challenges and risks, whether it's around supply chains or how to think about business models looking ahead. So I would say the world for the CEO in terms of risk has shifted more in the direction of politics, geopolitics, and still to some degree US-China than on the classic macroeconomic side, which is what CEOs used to think was the risk they had to spend the most time worrying about. The big challenge we're facing on climate right now is that for several years, we had a recognition in both the... Um, the public sector and in the private sector, that the risk posed by climate change were enormous. They were coming faster than we wanted. We weren't making the progress that we needed to, and we all needed to step up in terms of commitments. I think, and it led to some really important things, legislation in Europe, IRA in the US, legislation in Canada, Japan, uh, continued progress in China on many dimensions. So we, we were seeing the ideas and the concern translate into action. But we're in a year of many elections. Many, many topics have become political. Unfortunately, climate is one of those topics. Increasingly, um, parts of the climate community are turning to lawsuits uh, as the way to drive progress. But lawsuits then put the legal counsel much more front and center in corporate dialogues, and they tend to be extremely conservative, don't make any promises, don't say too much, stay quiet. So between the political voices that encourage uh, not taking a stand, getting caught in the middle of a debate, and the sort of challenges that companies feel about the risk of being too bold and um, too ambitious in their commitments, we are not and from what I can see, seeing companies pull back from previous commitments. But we are seeing much more caution about additional commitments and much more caution about the public dialogue they engage in around this. And what we don't know is how much of that is an election year and all of the challenges that that creates and people are going to sit on. And we'll see sort of because, the unfortunately, we can say whatever we want to say. The situation in the climate continues to be really challenged. Greenhouse gases continue to grow dramatically year after year after year. We can growing at 1% when we should be shrinking at 7% our greenhouse gas emissions. So is this a temporary pause in dialogue? moment is right, you know, we can start to accelerate progress again. It is easy to focus on the negative. In fact, it's often reinforced every day. You can't pick up a newspaper or, or listen to something on TV or on social and not on average hear a more negative voice rather than a more positive voice about what's going on. But I think we have to remember that we can make an enormous difference in this world. We've seen it in climate. We're seeing it real time right now in the way we're helping companies and in the public sector in some cases engage in generative AI and AI, the way we understand how people models and leadership models need to evolve. Our voice in the world matters. Our voice in the world has stayed quite consistent despite all that goes on around us. And I think people should take some energy from the impact that they can have as individuals, not just when things seem easy, but when things seem hard. And the second thing is not just from today, though some from today, but but also I was just on the West Coast. I've just been talking to clients around the world. There is so much exciting stuff happening. And, and the power of innovation, the power of business to be a force for change, the power to drive new sources of customer value, new opportunities for citizens to engage in their communities. I mean, yes, we have huge challenges 
including in this generative AI wave around whether it's IP protection or deep fakes and misinformation. I am not minimizing those. I hope governments will step up to figure out how to address those. But there are many, many positive elements. And, and there are so many discussions I'm in where I come away completely energized and excited about what's ahead. And I think, you know, Semaphore is two years old. And I just was talking to one of the founders and they were saying when they first had this idea and they didn't know where it would go, it was a BCG colleague, in this case, Russell Dubner, who said, it's a great idea. The world needs it. We'll find a way to help. And now here, there are thousands of people engaged in it these couple of days. They're at the very earliest stage of their journey. But, you know, sometimes just being ready to lend a hand, share an idea, partner with someone who's got something creative, but you don't know if it's going to work or not work. You can turn it into something kind of special. And I'm optimistic. It's early in the semaphore journey, but I'm optimistic this can be one of those things in the world. And and it will be their success, not our success, but we will have found a way to make us make a meaningful difference in that journey. And I think those moments don't come all the time and we should um know that we can feel really good about them when they do occur, even if it's not about us and we're not making a big deal about it in the broader world.